All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm here with, um, I don't want to mispronounce your name, uh, Leah Goodridge. Leah, okay. Leah. So I'm here with Leah Goodridge. And Leah, I know you have a lot of experience, so I'm just going to let you introduce yourself because um, I feel like you can do a much better job than I can with that. <laughs> Great. Well, hi, everyone. I'm Leah Goodridge. Um, I, am, I have two positions. One is I'm managing attorney for housing policy at an organization called Mobilization for Justice. That's really fancy language for I head a department which represents tenants facing eviction. And the other is I am a commissioner on the New York City Planning Commission. And we meet twice a week, every two weeks and decide all types of housing proposals as, whether of, as well as other land use proposals. Thank you for that, Leah. And um, before we go to the first question, now I kind of want to dig into um, kind of your experience throughout your career. So um, can you walk us through your career and what led you to your current position? That was um, the question that I had, but then you said you had two, so I'm going to amend it, your current positions. Sure. Um, you know, I, I am from New York. I'm from Brooklyn, and I went to law school in L.A., and then in, the, in between the three years that I went to law school and I came back, the rent has skyrocketed in New York City. I graduated in 2009. And when I came back, uh, it was the decision of what do I do with my career? And I actually failed the bar. I failed the bar twice. And that was quite an eye opener for me. It was not a fun experience. Um, I, no one could ever predict or tell me that I would be sitting here smiling about it because at the time it was not fun. <laughs> Um, nor, and it was an experience that I felt a lot of shame over and I would probably never tell anyone, but now I'm quite proud to say like, I filled the bar twice and I'm here. Um, and you know, uh, I, during that time, I actually taught at CUNY. I taught at Medgar Evers college. I taught folks how to start a small business and a nonprofit in their respective communities. And then job opening for a tenant's rights attorney at a local legal services nonprofit. And so ever since then, I've been in this world, which is a nonprofit legal services world, fighting gentrification as a tenant's rights attorney. Thank That's you. been 10 years. <laughs> Literally, like my, my head's spinning already. I'm like, oh, wow. I'm trying to keep track of like all the different jumps that happen. But I guess that ties in very nicely to the question that I had, which is how does affordable housing specifically in metropolitan areas affect the lives of professionals in the field with a special focus on professionals who work in public service? I mean, it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult because first of all, um, even if you are waiting for loan forgiveness, the fact of the matter in for working in public service, the fact of the matter is you still have to work for 10 years. You still, loan forgiveness doesn't mean that they'll help you pay your rent. Um, it, it just means that after the 10 years of paying that you may be forgiven. So when you're living in New York City, the rent is incredibly expensive. I just looked on the affordable housing list and I posted it on Twitter. My at, by the way, is Leah from Brooklyn. And a studio in East Blackbush on the affordable housing list for $2,431, over $2,400. And that's the affordable price. So imagine if you make $50,000 and your takeaway um, is less than that for each paycheck, I mean, it's just incredibly difficult to survive. I agree with you on that. And um, <clears throat> it's funny you mentioned that because um, I used to live by South Ozone Park. So I was right next to East New York. And uh, my father, I think, owned a piece of property there. And after a certain point, he was just getting like crazy bids, like super, super high over offer, unrealistic. Turns out they were just buying up a lot of the houses in that area to just tear it down and make bigger complexes. And I went to school in Southside Jamaica, Queens, and Jamaica Avenue was much different than um, it used to be. And one of my friends still lives there by Archer. And he tells me that there's two houses on his block and they've been holding out for, I think like five, 10 years for, from offers. But now they're starting to get offers where they're like, mm, okay, let me lean in a little bit more. And you know, who could blame them, of course. But then the plans are once they tear those down, it's going to be more apartments. And my friend was telling me the reason why it's going to make it much harder there too is parking. He pays the people who own the houses to park in the driveway. So now that you have another apartment there, parking's an issue. It just really exacerbates a lot of the cost for people in areas where the cost of living is already so extreme. Yeah, and we see a lot of these conversations and questions come up. 
at the City Planning Commission and specific to do with when you bring in large scale development, let's say that you know, a developer wants to build a building that would have a thousand units in an area that is mostly very residential and very quiet. What that means is more foot traffic. And oftentimes what that can mean is more noise, more waiting times for the nearby subway stop. I mean, I think that these are things that a lot of people might not think about, but it can really change the character of a neighborhood. You know, you can go from a very busy, um, or I'm sorry, you can go from a relatively quiet, uh, residential, peaceful neighborhood to, to one that is incredibly busy, incredibly crowded, um, more waste, more maintenance because of more garbage, more foot traffic, and it can change up everything. And it's um, this is a very great conversation. I've had like pretty character for a second to acknowledge that. But um, now I'm curious. I want to ask you, what major changes have you noticed throughout your tenure? Um, in your current positions. And I guess if you want, we can do, you know, positive and negative changes or just positive and like, I guess, ambivalent changes, things that are still open to interpretation. I mean, I'll start with the positive. The positive change is I, when I started as a tenants rights attorney about 10 years ago, um, there was no right to counsel. And what that means is, you know, you often hear if you have a criminal case and you're a defendant and you're not able to pay for an attorney, then one will be afforded to you, right? And that's called free, you know, your free attorney, your right to counsel. But that was only the case in criminal cases, criminal defense cases. It was never the case in a civil case, which is an eviction case, uh, or I'm sorry, an eviction case is a type of a civil case. And so, Ha a lot of housing advocates for decades have fought to have this right to counsel. And finally, in New York, it was passed. And that was five years ago. And I think that that's a very positive change because this really shaking things up, you know, instead of, you know, oftentimes you would have landlords bring tenants to court for really frivolous things, but, you know, things a rent that they might not have owed, but because they know that they can get them out easier, right? Because they come to court, they're scared, they get them to sign an agreement saying that they're gonna move out, they don't have to move out, but they still do it, and then they're rid of them. But now with the right to counsel, a lot of people have access to, uh, low-income people have access to an attorney, and it's a lot harder, a lot harder to um, really engage in the types of harassment that we used to see. So that's a good thing. That's one of the good points. The bad points, you know, and I think everyone knows this, but the gentrification in New York is just, it's, it's out of control. Um, the displacement, we have an entire new great migration. We had before decades ago, the great migration of black Americans who were from the South and moving North, moving to New York, moving to all of these different, you know, Northeastern cities. And now we have the complete opposite of that we have many Black Americans who are leaving New York, leaving New Jersey, leaving Connecticut, leaving Philadelphia, and moving down south. And why? Not because of politics, not because, because of housing affordability. Because many of them are working city jobs and other, you know, many, many types of jobs for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and still cannot afford to buy a home. And even if they can, it may be a co-op. Right. And so, you know, with the chance to buy a single detached home with land and room, people want that. And I don't blame them. And so they moved down south. It's funny you mentioned that, too, because um, that's one of the questions uh, I had as well. It's like, what are your thoughts on, you know, people leaving New York? And I guess um, I, I don't want to say mass exodus, but there have been a lot of people who have left New York. And a lot of them have cited affordability issues, saying it's just, as you said, much easier to go elsewhere. And there's a bigger plot of land with an actual detached single family home. I mean, listen, I don't I, I, I don't blame them. You know, um, I don't blame them. I mean, and and and. There are actually a lot of people who would like to do that, but don't have the financial capacity to do it. But that is a function of the market. That is a function of capitalism. That is a function of really the city not doing enough to provide affordable housing to keep people here. So I don't 
you know, people are doing what they have to do that's best for their families and navigating in the system. I think the conversation needs to be what can we do um, as a city to make the city more affordable, to make it more, because it's not even about just affordability. It's also, you know, making it a place where people want to live, you know, the livability where people want to live. So I think those conversations are the ones that we need to have. I don't, you know, I saw this article and it was, uh, I think the title of it was Miami residents are blaming New Yorkers for a high, for, you know, cause we're moving everywhere, moving all types of different places. And, you know, I think instead of having those conversations of tenants blaming tenants or residents blaming residents, I think we really need to look a little bit higher than that and talk about developers, landlords, elected officials, who really are the decision makers in creating this behemoth housing crisis. I agree with that um, wholeheartedly because uh, oftentimes I, I feel like this whenever, if I go back to Bangladesh where my family's from or another country, it's like the value of the currency is different. And so even in New York City, it's a high cost of living area. What you're gonna get over here, comparable to let's say South Carolina, Miami, Texas, you may think, oh my God, this is such a great deal. But then to the people who are native in those areas, they're like, well, now you're jacking it up for us as well. So it creates like right. a ripple effect because then eventually they'll right. move on from wherever they went to. So I agree, right. it have to be like a bigger systemic change. And um, going with that, what changes would you like to see in New York City's um, housing landscape? I think the number one change I'd like to see is when we do have housing that's built for there to be more funding for affordable housing. Um, you know, right now, the private market, I think, is in the driver's seat as the so-called um, party, the acting party who has been pegged to solve the housing crisis. And what that means is most of the housing that's being built are is by private developers. And so at the end of the day, when you have um, a private actor like that, a private developer that's building housing and that's putting up their own money, their interests are gonna lie with themselves. Their interests are gonna lie with profits over people. And so I do think that we need to take a step back and have a conversation about funding more affordable housing and funding coming straight from the city um, and being at the forefront, the city itself building more housing. I also think we need to have a conversation about not just building rentals, but ownership, you know, building more um, housing where people can own, you know, building more uh, Michelama co-ops, building more HPD co-ops, building houses, you know, I grew up with the Nehemiah houses in, in Brooklyn, but I think just having a mix of different types of housing where people can own, people can rent is also a part of the conversation. So. You know, it's a lot that we can discuss, but those are starting points. And in terms of, I guess, programs currently out there and available to people, um, do you think that the down payment assistance, I guess, in New York City, because I've researched a little bit and I've seen some on the HPD's website. Do you, think, Ma, yeah. <laughs> do you think those do um, a good job of bridging the gap uh, between, I guess, home ownership and the affordability for many residents in New York City? Well, here's the thing. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think the HPD one goes up to $40,000, um, if I'm not mistaken. And mm -hmm. I was going to say, uh, there was one that I was reading, it said up to 100000 but I'm not sure if that was New York State or New York City specific. Okay. Um, well, here's the thing. I just looked at one of the affordable uh, co-ops, meaning it's income restricted, and it was in Harlem. It was a two bedroom, two bath co-op for 630,000. So that means the down payment is $126,000 if you want a 20% down payment. And then the monthly HOA was 1445, okay? So I really think we need to have a conversation about it, you know, we there there have been a lot of conversations. I, I think, of course, the down payment assistance programs, we need more of that and we need to fund that more. But we also need to have a conversation about how a lot of these, you know, even the housing crisis, we can talk, you know, of course, that's the private market. People are trying to sell their homes and at the highest amount, of course, that's that's what you know we're expecting them to do and to get the highest amount of what they paid for. But those are, that's the affordable one, mind you. That's the, that's the HDFC affordable co-op. 
So, you know, I really think we need to always circle back to the conversation of how much do we have the housing in the first place? Is the pricing, what can we do to regulate the pricing of some of these rentals specifically? Um, so, yeah, I, 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 so the answer to your question is yes, we should have more down payment assistance, but I think the prices are so astronomical for even the affordable ones that I don't know that they're, that they're making a huge dent. Because then the other thing is even when they, because the prices are so high, there's definitely the down payment assistance. Then you have to actually pay the monthly maintenance, as the, the monthly mortgage, as well as whatever the maintenance fees are um, for a lot of these places. And so it's, it's a lot, the insurance, and most people can't afford it. So it, it's, even if you get the down payment help, there's still a question of keeping that property. Agreed. And, you know, sometimes it, it is the case where maybe you can afford the down payment, but then even in the process of saving for the down payment, the property might appreciate at a rate faster than you can accumulate your down payment. So what was once, let's say 20% in a year may be equivalent to 15% if the market values of the properties have gone up. So then that also kind of puts people in a vicious cycle to where even if they can attain it, it may eat up more than 50% of their take-home income, which, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the statistic for houses, it shouldn't take up more than like 30% of your take-home. It shouldn't take up more than 30%, but the vast majority of um, New Yorkers are rent, or what's the term for it is rent overburdened. Um, so it shouldn't, but it does, unfortunately. And what tips do you have for young professionals in areas where um, it's just a higher cost of living? <laughs> you know, um, it's difficult to, I pause because it's so difficult. I actually started in the world of, you know, community economic development. And some of that, a piece of that was a sort of like financial education, but how much do you advise people on financial education when it's not, much to do with them. You can save all you want, but like, it's 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 be a lot of it is beyond their control. I mean, I think the number one advice I have is there are multiple credit unions to join a credit union. A lot of them have financial classes that it's not only helpful for the financial education piece, but it's specifically helpful to cue you into what's out there. You know, programs that are out there keeping you in the loop. I think that that's incredibly helpful. Um, my other big tip, and some people are likely going to push back, is to please save for retirement. There's a huge, huge crisis going on right now where Americans are not putting money towards retirement for a good reason, because they're trying to make their rent. But then what's happening is, as we're seeing now, the early results is that people don't have anywhere to go when they're in their 60s. Um, and their support system is gone. And so if you can even just put in the, as much as you can, it is really, really important to prioritize that because it's harder to catch up than it would have been even if you started small, but earlier on. So for any age professionals, I would definitely advise you this, but particularly if you were just starting out, please prioritize with retirement. Um, and don't take your money out to buy a house. Don't, don't. Um, just literally just put it in there and then forget about it. Um, and, you know, I think, I think you need the, the third piece of advice is I think you need to sort of, um, make a decision about what works for you. It may not work for you to buy in New York city. It could work for you if you have a, a relatively affordable apartment, or if you happen to get one of those affordable apartments on the housing lottery to stay there, save your money, and then decide later what you want to do. But at the end of the day, um, you know, you have to do what's best for you. And for some people that looks like saving your money while you are in an affordable rental, or if your rental is expensive anyway, then going and buying something. So it all depends.
And, you know, just hearing you talk, I'm just like, wow, it's insane to see the ripple effects of affordable housing, because as you were saying, like, I'm thinking about, I'm like, you're right, it does cripple the, I guess, um, efforts of people to actually save towards retirement. And oftentimes, when you're in an area where there is high cost of living, you're already relying on that support system, as you mentioned. And then when you get older, that same level of support's not there. And then there's that disconnect, no, you know, savings for retirement, plus the support system not there. And then you can't afford wherever you were and you have to go elsewhere and, you know, take whatever skills that you have and try to start over. It's um pretty, I guess, thought provoking to think about. And um, I guess it does seem like a very, very big, massive change. But I guess if we were to take smaller steps in the right direction, what does that look like to you? Regarding retirement? Um... Oh, no, just like in because like in general like um solving affordable housing and kind of where we're at and i know again it's going to be a very very long journey to solve it but like the smaller steps to get there um i think that we need there's a rent guidelines board there are different types of housing in new york city by the way there's rent regulated housing there's public housing there's a private market housing um there are co-ops there, there are all types of housing um there is a board called the Rent Guidelines Board, and it makes the decisions every year about the percent by which they will increase the renewal leases for rent stabilized and rent regulated housing. And I think that that part can be strengthened. I think that well, I was on that board, and I think that one of the one of the areas would be that that board recognizing that we need to freeze rents to stabilize the rents because the rents are. I mean, the median rent right now in Manhattan has is now at four thousand dollars right and so it's just it's a lot we need to stabilize rent um again like i said before we need to infuse uh infuse new york city with more affordable housing and when i say affordable i think we need to have a conversation about what affordability means because for some people uh affordability means eighty thousand making eighty thousand dollars for one person um and that is, I mean, there's a real question about whether that really should even be included into our concept of afford for affordable housing for an income. Because it can go all the way up to like $150,000, by the way, the eligible incomes for affordable housing. So it's right. So it's a lot. So I think that we need to have those conversations. I think that we need to ensure that lower income bans people making um, $25,000 less, you know, zero is are also included in the income bans for affordable housing that's being built. At, at the end of the day, the folks who were driving the taxis, the folks who were delivering food, these are the people who kept New York City running at the height of the pandemic. And so when we are creating housing policy, we need to think about them. We need to think about them. We need to prioritize them and think, where will these folks live? And from where I'm sitting, I don't think that that's, I don't think that we're doing that enough. Thank you for that, Leah. And um, before we finish off this segment, um, I just want to give you the chance if you want to say anything to our viewers. Uh, this segment was, in my opinion, very, very thought provoking. It definitely gave me a lot of think about come over here, just like, like scratching my head. The gears are turning and I'm like, huh, you know, it really is like it's daunting, you know, to think about. But again, uh, I'll let you say your final piece to our viewers before um, we end off this segment. Uh, my final piece of advice is to reach out to your elected officials specifically, reach out to the mayor, reach out to your borough president, reach out to your city council member, reach, reach out to your assembly member and tell them that affordable housing is important to you and it's a make or break issue in terms of whether you support them or not. Uh, I do think that even though people on the ground often raise this as an issue, um, I think it needs to be raised a little bit more with elected officials and mainly when you are speaking with them, know that many of these elected officials have a part in appointing people to boards, such as the Rent Guidelines Board, such as the City Planning Commission, both of which I am on and have been on. And these are the folks who are making the housing policy decisions. So you want to let them know that you want people in those positions who are tenant friendly, who um, are fighting for the working class, and we're fighting for people with no incomes, all, all types of incomes in the city that make the city run. So that's the most important message that I would say to folks. Thank you for that, Leah.